Oh, it was just a nightmare, right? All performance cycling requires a good bike fit and sorted touch points. But Randoneering is unique in that your bike needs to be sustainably comfortable for very long distances. A randonneur will endure road conditions like bumps and road buzzes uh, throughout each brevet, which have a negative impact on fatigue, motivation, and health. Hand, wrist, and saddle soreness are the most direct symptoms of exposure to rough road conditions, but neck, back, and shoulder soreness can also be attributed. These symptoms arise from cumulative effects of pressure, friction, and increased whole body muscle engagement in rough conditions. Saddle sores are particularly problematic due to the pain and risk of infection. Performance also suffers. According to a foundational piece of research on vibration in cycling, participants exposed to vibration via the cranks could endure only 47 minutes of a workout when 60 minutes was achieved without vibration. A recent study found large increases in perceived exertion, heart rate, VO2, and blood lactate, while another found more modest 2.7% increase in oxygen consumption and a 5-7% to increase in heart rate when the riders were experiencing vibrations. As mentioned in a previous video, fatigue and higher perceived exertion have a negative impact on overall motivation. This information matches with the experience of most randonneurs too. We can confidently say that a bike with suitable compliance to big bumps and vibration damping is important to reduce the pressure and friction experienced at touch points, various fatiguing factors, and general effort on long distance rides like brevets. Most randonneurs already value comfort, but as with most things in cycling, Comfort isn't free. Let's look at the most common ways cyclists improve their insulation from harshness and vibration and evaluate the benefits and compromises they incur. First, old cycling gloves and bib shorts have degraded padding. Quality kit in the first half of their lifespan is a must for long training rides and brevets. Rotate the older kit to indoor training and short ride duty. Next, thick or double-wrapped bar tape adds some cushions for the hands. It adds very little weight and also costs very little. Some riders may not like the girth of double-wrapped bars, and there may be a minor aerodynamic drag, but having thick or double-wrapped bar tape is a highly rated improvement for comfort. Next, reduced tire pressure helps absorb impacts and vibration. It improves rolling resistance on rough tarmac, improves braking grip and weft grip. Too low of tire pressure will increase the risk of pinch flats and rim impacts while increasing rolling resistance on good tarmac. If the tire pressure you want is too low for your tire volume to safely handle, you can access more comfort with a larger tire or maybe a tubeless tire. Testing and adjusting tire pressure is highly recommended. I like the uh, AXS tire pressure calculator as a starting point. Many riders find they have been running pressure much too high and can just access free comfort. Larger tires are popular among randonneurs because they allow access to lower pressures needed for rough pavement and to fine-tune comfort, especially comfort targeting vibration. While it is incorrect to say that wide tires are faster than narrow tires, they do offer roughly equal rolling resistance at equal levels of comfort as their narrow counterparts if the tire construction is kept constant. The larger tire will need a lower pressure to equal the comfort given by a narrow tire. A wider tire at equal pressure will feel more harsh than the narrow tire. The actual performance trade-offs of wide tires are in rolling resistance due to tire construction, the aerodynamic penalties, and a little bit of extra weight. From an aerodynamic perspective, we know wider tires will be slower because they add frontal area. Swiss side testing found one and a half to two aerodynamic watts at 30 kilometers an hour, or 4.2 to 5.7 aero watts at 45 kilometers per hour, for each five millimeters of added tire width over 35 millimeters, 
when using a wide, mid-depth carbon wheel. It is also likely that wide tires increase the coefficient of drag by making a light bulb shape mounted on narrow rims. Hunt and Swiftside have both measured these effects in wind tunnels when researching gravel wheels and tires. Hunt found that wide, mid-depth rims with aero spokes save 9 watts at 32 kilometers per hour over narrow, shallow rims with round spokes. They were using a 38C gravel tire, but they were only testing a single front wheel with no bike. Swissside found 1.8 watts at 30 kilometers per hour, or 5.4 watts at 45 kilometers per hour, in a similar comparison with a 40 millimeter tire. Notably, Swissside tested using a complete bike, and their narrow rims use similar aero spokes as their wide mid-depth rims. Moving to fast tires in the 28 to 32C range hits a sweet spot between comfort and efficiency. The Brooks B17 and similar saddles are ubiquitous on randonneuring bikes. These beautiful boat anchors offer wonderful comfort to many cyclists riding in upright positions. In my few years of riding a B17, I love the buttery smooth leather that seemed to guard against friction and just gave the perfect amount of support. For non aero bar users, the extra weight is probably very easy to justify. They just feel good. Unfortunately, they are wholly unsuitable for use with aero bars, another prized piece of comfort kit and a keystone position for efficiency. Speaking of aero bars, they are an obvious choice for high speed efficiency, but are less acknowledged for their comfort. Resting the hands, repositioning the pelvis, adjusting the back and neck, spread the burden of supporting the body. 400 grams and $150 well spent, if you ask me. However, lots of time training and adjusting to the position is needed. Highly adjustable aero bars are usually a requirement for a randonneuring use case. Unfortunately, so is rethinking your bike fit. They take up valuable handlebar space too and limit storage options. In my opinion though, aero bars are a must have item for an overbiked randonneur, but they come with many caveats. Now let's discuss active suspension systems, which provide 10 to 30 or more millimeters of travel to insulate riders from bumps and to some extent vibration. Active suspension systems allow a rider to benefit from a very fast tire while still experiencing a high level of comfort. These systems will add weight, maintenance, and complexity to a bike system in whole. They may be the ideal solution for a randonneur seeking peak efficiency and more comfort. First up is suspension forks. These add both comfort and control to a bike when roads get rough. Gravel suspension forks like the 1000 US dollar 850 gram undamped Lauf Grit SL fork and the 800 US dollar 1.3 kilogram but damped RockShox Explore forks offer 30 to 40 millimeters of travel that contain both vibrations and big hits. Retrofitting these to your bike can alter bike geometry, handling, and fit. While there's no data available, the shape of the RockShox fork suggests it would have a significant negative impact on aerodynamics. The Loft fork would have some too, but probably be less compromised in that way. Having ridden a softer sprung mountain bike focused Lauf model for a few years, I loved the comfort and that it required no maintenance. But I found the bobbing effect bothersome and the cornering on tarmac was dull and imprecise, even though it was really great on light single track. The firmer Grit SL model they offer should perform better on the road, but I can't say for sure. Overall, these are probably not best suited to a rendering bike aimed at peak efficiency but may actually be a top pick if your randonneuring bike doubles as your gravel bike. The next bit of active suspension to discuss are add-on suspension stems and seat posts. These suspend the rider from the movements of the bike. While they won't help much in keeping the tire in contact with road and rough conditions, they perform well for strictly rider comfort. Most include 20 to 35 millimeters of travel and adjustable resistance. These can be added to any bike with standard sized uh, steerer and seat post tubes. The weight penalty from lightweight models of suspended seat posts and stems are minor, but the heavier options can get quite heavy and you probably wouldn't want to add them to a randonneuring bike. The Canyon Leaf Spring seat post variants, the Cane Creek EE Silk, 
and the Redshift Pro suspension seat posts, as well as the Redshift Standard and Pro stems are all highly rated and on the lightweight end of add-on suspension systems. Prices can be expected to start around 350 US dollars and go up to five or 600 depending on the system you choose. Some suspension seat posts are affected by or incompatible with some types of large saddle packs. And these are arguably the best option for storage on very long or bad weather brevets. Another downside to these systems is that many modern bikes are using more proprietary components which make these parts incompatible, maybe with your current bike or possibly the bike you will want in the future. Seat post shapes are especially problematic here, but integrated stems are closing in fast. Speaking of proprietary components, a wide range of them are offered by bike manufacturers to aid in comfort. Each of these adds some weight, maintenance, and cost to a bike, but this is to be expected and acceptable for those interested. These range from minor elements with minor benefits like compliant carbon layups and D-shaped seat posts, to major features with significant benefits like Trek isospeed decouplers, specialized future shock, Cannondale lefty fork with rear passive suspension linkages, the Moots YBB suspension system, and the high ride suspension system that's found on bikes from BMC and Pinarello. Costs of these systems vary widely. Proprietary systems like this provide comfort and they still give riders access to elements of peak bike design. Consider the aerodynamics of the Trek Madone. Unfortunately, proprietary dumpster fires like the defunct specialized SCS wheel spacing standard need to be navigated too. Users of proprietary systems are locked into them and may or may not be supported years down the road. These elements can't be transferred from bike to bike either, so the frame you choose is hopefully the correct one for your use case. If you're drawn to a bike with proprietary systems like this, consider serviceability in the future. Red deneurs are especially hard on bikes and suspension parts necessarily move and wear. For example, ISO speed bikes use small standard size bearings, which is good, but they also have a proprietary seat post and seat mast. Lefty fork wheels use special hubs, and the Future Shock has only a 500 hour service life, which, while fine for most cyclists, might not be suitable for a randonneur. That said, the benefits of these proprietary systems are real, and they're unique in how they can provide comfort to a bike that's still seeking to squeeze every last bit of performance from each watt. Even triathlon bikes are entering the active suspension game, like the Trek Speed concept. So. With all that choice, what should an overbiked randonneur do when in need of more comfort? Well, keep your kit fresh, the tire air pressure on your moderate width tires monitored, and your aero bar bike fit dialed, just to start. The big choice after that is whether to commit to a comfort focused bike with proprietary parts or to use bolt on suspension components on a bike with traditional part standards. There is no right or wrong answer as it depends on your budget, how promiscuous you are with your bike frames, and also just your personal preferences. Subscribe to my channel and find out which system I choose and how it performs in a future video. Hope this video was helpful for you all. Enjoy your rides, be comfortable, be efficient, and I'll see you in the next one.